Welcome to the One Million Years of Joy podcast. I'm Dr. Andrea Benacar, your host, and my intention is to inspire you to find more joy in your life through the stories from our guests and the science on joy and purpose. Welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to introduce to you today Lynn Lambrack that I've had the pleasure actually to work with for several years while she was based in Montreal and we were both working for the International Air Transport Association at the time. Lynn has a fantastic career in the aviation world. She has spent many years living abroad. And most recently, she launched a company called The Living Planner based out of California, which is helping individuals take the guesswork out of managing everyday life in advance of unexpected events. Lynn, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show today. Welcome. Bonjour, Andrea. It's wonderful to see you again. Likewise. So Lynn, since I've known you and since we had the pleasure of working together, you've always been a source of sunshine and <laughs> laughter. Every single time I would pass by your office, every single interaction was so positive. And I think it really also reflects, you know, your energy and the joy that you exude through every interaction. I'm just so delighted to have you on the show so you can share your secrets (laughs) to being as joyful with the world so we can spread more joy collectively. I think the joy project, I mean, I'm loving what you're doing with this because at the end of the day, each of us can make huge differences. I mean, we're one drop that creates a ripple and I'm happy to be here. Fantastic. So Lynn, let's begin talking about joy and what actually is a primary source of joy in your life today? Uh, I have way too many. I mean, I am a little, I'm a bit of the life simple pleasures. I love waking up in the morning and opening up my eyes and knowing that there's another day to explore. I'm insatiably curious. I know that there's always possibility in this world and um, jumping out of bed, I get to like throw my arms over my head and say, it's a great day to have a great day. Because I believe inherently that attitude is a choice. <clears throat> and much to the chagrin of my uh, mom, when I was little, she'd be like, oh, my God, where did you come from? And I'd laugh and say, you and dad. you know." So it's just something that's inherent in me. And I think that there are lots of things that aren't pleasant. And I recognize that, too, in the reality of day-to-day life. Yet, what I also know is that I have clean water to drink. I have lights that I can turn on. I am safe. I love and I am loved. And that to me is a little bit of everything. I love it. And I love the curiosity and the possibility of exploration. If we can all embrace (laughs) this reality every single day, no matter what comes our way, whether it's positive things or negative things, we can all live more joyfully. So thank you for sharing that. So tell me now how you find joy in actually bringing joy to others in your life. Uh, You know, I think the joy to others, everybody's in a different place in different times. And we know that. But if we can be sensitive enough to others, I think that sometimes, again, I'll go back to my little things. Everyone, we were, Andrea and I were talking a little bit before I came, and I'm helping a friend's mom currently who has had some surgery. And okay, let's just get to nuts and bolts here. She loves to have like little snacks. And I'm like the queen of playing in the kitchen. So you know what? It's the little touches that we can bring to someone else. When we are other focused and not just all about us, and we're living within a community, I like smile at the people in the grocery store. I say hello and ask how they're doing. When I stop somewhere, you know, I pay attention. Honestly, I I believe that all of us wish to be seen and heard and valued. So I figured that that's up to me to model that for others, but also for myself, because it feels good to have others feel good. Yes. So well said, Lynn. And and tell me where this perspective on joy comes from and how has it been influenced by maybe your family, your experiences, 
business, particularly living abroad. What can you tell us about that? You know, it's interesting. I grew up in a small city in the Midwest, and there were people of all, you know, ages nearby. And I, my brother and sister still tell me that I was the one at age four, I left the house and went to go check on all the neighbors and say hi and make sure everybody had what they needed. I grew up in a family that was a little bit different than me. My dad was older and in World War II, and I was kind of a surprise child uh, coming well after my siblings. I think that the seriousness sometimes within the house, and my mom was not exactly Miss Joyful, and I realized that that wasn't who I was really early. And thankfully, I had an amazing neighbor and an amazing aunt, and my dad was like a real softy, even though he was a little more staid. And I just, I saw, you know what? I just really kind of like being, and yes, I read all my crazy children's books. And I mean, I started reading when I was like age three and I've been a reader all my life. So I think it helped me learn how to explore. So moving away from home to attend college and graduate school and beginning an aviation career and traveling for the first time internationally really kind of lit the fire of, hey, this world is really big and all of us are humans. So let's see what the impact has been for other people in different places and learn about different cultures. So I traveled a lot with work and then had an opportunity to move abroad. And that for me really showed me that the world was a big place. And the way that I had, you know, been in my little spot was a wonderful foundation. And yet seeing how others live and seeing how others exist and, you know, work and enjoy life, that gave me even more inspiration to have a complete appreciation for being born in North America and the advantages that we have here. I make lemonade out of lemons. And it's just one of those things that's been, I think, inherent for me since birth, but also influenced by seeing the polarity of a little bit of light and a little bit of darkness, you know, at home. So that allowed me to make a choice young. And that's something I, you know, constantly play with. I love it. And having lived in Asia for a number of years and in Montreal as well, what can you tell us about any insights or joyful experiences in that journey where you're actually living outside of North America? You know, the kindness of people comes through wherever you are. I remember traveling before I lived in China, traveling to Japan and Korea and the Philippines. That was my first international trip. And it was fascinating to me because Because in the Philippines, people were so happy. You know, there was just that whole joy thing for them was real. Going to Korea and Japan after that showed me a completely different side. There wasn't a whole lot of English and postings because this was way back in the 80s. So there, you know, the English language was not prevalent throughout the society. And I remember a kind person at the hotel in Japan telling me how I could mark spots getting on the bullet train in all Japanese to go where I needed to go. And so the cute part is that I'll still remember Ichi ni san shi go loku and knew I had to count like in my own brain in Japanese, how many counts to get off at the proper stop. People, I mean, I think that as long as we can respect one another, I mean, I knew that I looked different. I knew that I was different, but I also didn't want to have that that depiction of being the ugly American because so often I've seen people travel and it's hilarious because when they're not understood, sometimes they're screaming or whatever. And I'm thinking, hmm, people don't have a hearing problem. They just have a language problem. But I mean, even in the markets in Montreal, Andrea, it was hilarious. I started trying to practice my French that I had taken for one year in high school and having the shopkeepers, and we know when I would say, je ne parle pas de français, je parle en anglais, you know, and they'd say, but you're speaking to me in French. And then we would just laugh. So I don't know. I think the approachability of others is something that I will always take as a gift wherever. In Asia, the culture is really different, especially living in China. 
in that piece, their lives were very different than mine. And I was living there in the 90s. So it was more bicycles than cars at that time. And there were, you know, donkeys and goats with carts, you know, driving people. But I remember walking into our office and realizing that most of the staff there, they had to like literally be on a bike or walk to get to work. And I thought, huh, they're customer facing employees. And I remember petitioning back with Chicago and saying, I want to shower in this office so people can feel, you know, good about themselves. They were like, what? So, I mean, just trying to explain to others who haven't lived away the impact of what we take for granted every day. That just is always, I want to always put myself in someone else's shoes and see the world from their eyes. I love it. And as you're sharing this experience, and as you've mentioned, being in China, being abroad so many years ago, I'm curious if you can share with us how your view on joy, on joyful journeys has shifted, if at all in any way, since you were that young little girl that you described earlier. Because often, you know, we start our career and yes, new experiences come along and we have a certain vision of what joy would look like or what our life would look like. And then as we evolve on this journey, we realize, wow, I'm not feeling as joyful as I thought in this specific moment. I reach a specific milestone. So I'm curious if you can tell us if your views on joy have shifted since you were beginning your career in comparison to what Where you're I am. doing now and how you're seeing things from a different lens. You know, I think in the beginning of my career, I thought, you know, the world was all ahead of me. And that was something that I was eager to experience and have Having older siblings who had both lived abroad and were doing their thing, I was anxious, you know, to get on my path. And I had an interruption, if you will, from the standpoint of actually being a volunteer emergency team responder and seeing things that I didn't know that I would ever see in this world. But rather than having that impact me into the negative, again, it gave me a reaffirmation of saying that every day is an opportunity and every day is a gift. So I think I really experienced that heavily. Now, I'll tell you every now and again, I have to laugh because, you know, colleagues aren't always as uh, embracing and some people are going to step on you and you're going to learn about different things that aren't as pleasant and you see fraud and you see all of this other stuff. And I always said to myself, please don't allow me to ever harden my heart to the point where I can't see the good because I inherently believe that all people want to do the right thing and do good things. And so I realized pretty early that there are just times that people have a bad day or they've been hurt in other ways that I might not ever understand. And so I'm a pretty empathetic soul. And I also realize when people don't want to hear like the uplift. So, I mean, I can shut it pretty well. On the other hand, if sometimes if it's just opening up your office door to say, come on in and I've got two ears to hear what's going on. I think it's being sensitive to people beyond you and just kind of seeing what's going on and determining if you can do something. So yeah, I've been kicked down a few times, but I have to tell you, I have always found the way to skin my knees and get up. Beautiful. And I really love the compassion piece and putting yourself in other people's shoes and understanding that, yes, we may all be walking around with these invisible scars. You know, when I was yep. dealing with my own issues and I was diagnosed with a tumor, I did not disclose it for so long to even some very close friends and those invisible scars indeed uh, can be very daunting and very heavy to walk around with so you're a gift to this world to actually have that perspective and basically looking at also at the positive things because indeed our, our brains you know have this negativity bias and it's so yes. easy to dive into the negativity and these negative comments that maybe some people are making and actually let that ruin our day rather than truly understand that wow maybe this person is really struggling with some things mm -hmm. and it's not easy for them and that's what you're seeing it's really an exposure of some of those hidden challenges that they may be facing. I think especially now, even during still the pandemic and after the pandemic, we're realizing that we're frail as human beings. And I think that frailty is a vulnerability. And if we can take the vulnerability and just say, you know what, that's what makes me human. That is the side of me that can be more compassionate to others when I recognize it even within myself. So I think that applying lessons learned along the way has been something that truly, you know, to answer really your question, I am who I was. I also have reaffirmations along the way. 
And then there are times when I even get tired of myself and it's like, oh, for heaven's sake. So every now and again, I mean, you have to just kind of gauge who you are, how you are, do a mental health and internal check and see how you're doing. Because learning how to ask for help when you need it, that is a gift. And I, being the giver, I finally taught myself, hey, other people love to give as much as you do. And by denying them, I'm denying, you know, an openness in a relationship. So I think that if we're humble enough to realize that we're continuing to evolve and grow, and that we learn things about ourselves and others along the way, that we get to choose, you know, what inspires me and what expires me. Pay attention, you know, each of us. And I would much rather be in the inspired part than in the expired, but I pay attention to that expired because then it's like, <laughs> maybe put a pause on that one. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So well said. So tell me how, in the way you look at life, how has this shaped what you do today with mm. the launch of the Living Planner? It's actually the evolution of my personal and professional life. When my mom was on her final descent, when I left Montreal and came back to the States to help, I asked myself that question of saying, okay, hold on a second here. Do you have business skills? You have this, you know, from a skill side and talent side. And I said, but hold on, where's your heart to serve? Where do you want to be here? And I kept kind of taking a look around and saying, boy, there's a gap in this society. People are really hesitant to talk about any time that maybe there's an illness or an incapacity, and then especially the mortality piece that comes into play where people don't want to talk about it. But because I think I had been so involved in working in the crash sites, but then also being a part, you know, coming back from Asia when my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and then leaving Montreal with mom and her final descent, I thought, hold on, there's a whole lot of stuff going on on this administrative side of life that people, could, if they could feel the comfort and having that planning finish so that we could build a muscle in advance of needing it, we can feel emotion in the appropriate time, but we can also take some practical action in advance. And I thought, I want to go be a proactive cheerleader. I just want people not to be scared and not to you know, feel intimidated by legalese and all the financial stuff and all the insurance protection stuff. I thought, ah, let's just make this more doable. So that's why the Living Planner was actually born so that it could be a source of information. I could be an ally. I could be an advocate. I could also be a listener to their exact situation, whether they own a small business or they're working or whatever. And I thought, hey, this is a different kind of consultancy. And I'd like to play with this in advance so that people have contingency plans ready to go. And, and it's so important, I think, in a world where often we may walk around on certain days thinking that we are immortal. <laughs> and then of course. life events happen oh. and we realize that we're not. And some people have this realization, you know, early in life, some later in life. And I think the work that you're doing is so beautiful and so essential in awakening individuals to the reality that no one is immortal. And if we actually take the time to plan things right, it's not just uh, bringing more ease for us, but it's and also our loved more ones. ease and, you know, for our families, for our loved ones, rather than having them do all the hard work that typically happens right after. So really, I'm curious to know uh, the reality behind this immortality <laughs> perspective and how have you actually been able to overcome that in a society, as I said, that often forgets that we are not immortal. Well, what's so dang funny is that I laugh and just say, I'm just gum on the shoe here. You know, I mean, we're going to have a little bit of sass with some honest talk because at the end of the day, living life fully every day is the goal. You know, so let's focus on what the goal is and then, okay, there can be some interruptions. And so how prepared are you for the interruptions? People don't communicate real well and don't always know how to communicate real well because there can be inherent fears and biases. Andrea, one of my favorite stories is working with uh, some people who literally the one person looked at me and said, oh my God, if something happens to us, it's on you. 
And I burst out laughing and I said, oh, I may be powerful, but I am not that powerful (laughs) now. And the spouse was just laughing because I thought, you know what? We have superstitions that we carry with us too. So we have to be sensitive to like that stuff and yet still say, hold on. But, you know, there is a what if side to different things. And are you ready for them? Long before there was a pandemic, I kept saying, well, there are lots of natural disasters and they can be, you know, man-made or they whatever because you know I'm sorry we have weather events everywhere and if you had to pick up and leave could you start over this isn't just about when we might be feeble or disabled this is about living and just knowing that we can do what we want to do how we want to do it with information that we need at any time so I am like the real practical one but I realize I'm a big fat sap so I will be like connected with people but I just try to make it more approachable. I think that's my goal. Fantastic. So happy that you're doing this. It's so important in our world. No, thank you. So Lynn, tell me now, if we were to take away your achievements, your titles, your culture, how would you describe yourself in a couple of words? Authentic and curious. I am a lifelong learner, a bit of an adventurer. I just... I don't know. I embrace the day. I love it. So because of your adventurous side, tell us one of your craziest adventures. I think it was setting the goal for myself that I was going to see a sunrise and a sunset in all seven continents by age 55. And when I was 54, before my 55th birthday, I booked my trip to Antarctica. And I think what's funny about that is that, you know, I've had the opportunity to be and work on six continents. So the Antarctica piece, and I love exploring cities and museums and music and art, you know, all of that stuff and go hiking and do all of that. Antarctica was none of it. It was no people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw krill, you know, and I kept thinking, why is pink bubble gum out there? And it was krill. And I cracked up laughing. It was so cool to just be in silence with natural beauty surrounding me. So it wasn't maybe not the adventure of, you know, going somewhere as most people would explore. But for me, that was the adventure to really learn to sit back and almost have that silence part rather than the perpetual activity. That was that adventure. So it was experiencing a different part of the world in a place that everyone doesn't go to and talking with the people at McMurdo and Palmer and asking them from the international teams what they were finding in their studies. And, you know, so I could still engage the brain and get the curiosity going, but then look at utter beauty and quiet. It was wonderful. Yes. And I think when you're saying that, this reminds me of the experiences also in traveling all over the world. And there's man-made beauty and there's natural beauty. And we were not too long ago in Zermatt in Switzerland. And I was just in awe by the magnificence of these mountains that were just so incredible. So I I I remember when you and I and Montreux walked out to that castle. Remember that? And (laughs) that was kind of the same thing because we just stood there stilly watching. And I mean, there's beauty that's everywhere. And I love um, both man-made and natural, but the natural part, oh boy, it's bigger than us. Indeed, this is when you realize the smallness of humanity in the vastness of this universe. Mm -hmm. So with your view and experiences in life, what advice would you give someone that is maybe struggling to find joy in their own life? Is there one thing that actually lights you up and makes you smile? Whether it's making a beautiful cup of tea or pulling out a good book or having a phone call with someone. I mean, is there one thing? Because I think sometimes we get so overwhelmed with the enormity. And so I, okay, I have a very warped sense of humor, people. And so I call it the toilet flush. I mean, when the bad thought comes, it's kind of like watching that water go down the bowl. So what is the one thing that can like, stop that in its tracks and have you almost reset so that you can say, oh, wait, hold on. That does bring me a smile. I think it starts, I mean, with us and finding like one little thing. I agree. And then the momentum can build from there because then it's one thing. I'm the goofball that says thank you to a stoplight that turns green. (laughs) 
You know, I mean, so I mean, I love to find the in between little appreciations along the way that we sometimes just get on autopilot and ignore. So being mindful and actually noticing rather than just kind of living through something, what are we living? Yeah. So being curious about things big and small. And yeah. finding one thing to bring a smile. I love it. And talking about bringing a smile, I know you had shared with me, particularly given that your mother had Alzheimer's and so on, and, and how yeah. Yeah. you you were exploring before she actually advanced more in that disease, how basically you're exploring the five senses. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how- I can't. I mean, it was with my parents and you guys, they really did think I was kind of- because I was different. It was dad that had the Alzheimer's. And the interesting piece is that when they were in their 70s, and okay, I was in my 30s, I remember being home sitting in the living room. And I just said, what is quality of life to you? And they kind of now please understand that my family, a lot of medical people in my family. So they were kind of looking at me with this. "Mm -hmm -hmm." And I said, well, no, honestly, because if things changed, you know, what is it? I said, let's just kind of think about what are the things that you love to see? What are the things that you love to hear? What are the things that you love to smell and taste and feel? And I think the the beauty is that once they started talking, it was wonderful because it was like the floodgate opened. So when dad had, you know, with his Alzheimer's, he didn't know who I was. And honestly, that was okay. I mean, I just wanted him to be safe and comfortable and all of that. So I knew he wanted to be outside on the back deck, listening and seeing the birds and, you know, seeing the trees. And I would put on Nat King Cole for his music. And I'd make sure that he had like the little, little nibbles he liked. And then when mom, same kind of thing. I mean, my little, my sweet tooth mom, who was a cookie monster at heart and, um, but also loved chocolate. I knew she needed to have like little snacks and I knew she wanted soft things and I knew what music she wanted. You guys, it's a gift. And to know that even about ourselves, because I think maybe it's that back to that one thing that brings you a smile. I mean, I know I'm going to want to have different aromatherapy smells and I know that I'm going to want to have soft things nearby. And I know that I am going to want that cup of tea. And I know that, you know, the other things. So to be able to think about that and share it with people so that they can provide you some comfort, even when things are so different that you might not recognize yourself. It's it's really kind of a cool thing. Yes, it's a gift. It's really a beautiful gift. And I agree. Let, let's discover all those things for ourselves. And, and let's also discover it for all the other important family members. Uh, we want them to smile more. We want them to have more joy, irrespective of circumstances. Correct. So Correct. Beautiful. It's just me being, I don't know. I thought, well, I know I'd want to know about this. <laughs> and so I started telling them what I liked and that's what opened up the floodgate. It was amazing because I knew even when dad didn't know me, he would have a smile. I love it. Wow. What a beautiful way to bring joy to others. Yeah. And see, it's those little things. Indeed. Indeed. It is. So, so Lynn, to finish off the, the podcast, I, I just have a few quick questions that I want to ask you. One is, if you would have one superpower, what would it be and why? Ooh. I'd like to hone my x-ray vision even more so that I can see things beyond the surface. Wow. Love it. So profound. Why is that important for you? Because it allows me to even clue in more than I try to do today. And so that I can be sensitive to others and respectful. Beautiful. Second question. What is a fun fact about you that not many people know about? Ooh, a fun fact about me. Okay, you guys, this might get back to my joy. I fell off an 18 foot seawall when I was 20 years old and I was died and brought I died and I was brought back. Wow. And so that's something that I live with and remember more poignantly now because you know what? My neck can sometimes really hurt. I look at it this way. It's my humble reminder that I can fall and get back up. So I think that's maybe that's my strange thing about being so young and not having an aversion to talking about accidents or death because I've been I've come through that. So I that was behind the living planner too. I thought, well, that's a piece of the patchwork quilt that I have. So yeah, um that is an interesting fact that not everyone knows. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing and what an incredible experience and and how beautiful to see how actually years later it has shaped what you do today. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, I know. I know. Just like we're working the crash sites. Because honestly, all of those things taught me, sometimes it's the horror of the moment, but then what it is, is, okay, how do we come from that horror? And that's my curious side. So I think that that was always the, huh, how can we be comfy no matter what? And But I also know that some experiences, you know, I don't know that we're ever going to be comfortable with. So how can we bless and release them and allow them to be the lesson that, you know, of how maybe you don't want to be? So I have a tendency to look at some encounters as lessons and they can, you know, help me on the path to move more towards that. Or they can teach me how, what I'd like to move away from and how I, I would rather reposition and position myself for a little bit of goodness in this world. Beautiful. So any final thoughts on joy, on bringing more joy to this world? How, how may we help you and support you in getting the message out of saying that life can have joy no matter what? That's my question for you, madame, mm-hmm. because I think in some ways what you're doing is bringing forward a really positive thing. And at this time when many people need it. Yes. Well, that's so kind, Lynn. And as you know, our aspiration is really to gather information from Mm -hmm. individuals in all walks of life of all age groups and be able to highlight how joy is humanity's, I would say, almost birthright and how, you know, no matter where you are, no matter what realities you may be facing, that there's always a way back to joy. So when we reach a million years of joy, by adding up the ages of all the people we'll be talking to, either that will be interviewed on the podcast or will be contributing to the research we do, we'll be sharing the outcome and the insights. And I'm just so excited to also Mm -hmm. have this global perspective. So the more we can encourage people to either participate in the research by sharing the link that you're aware of, the more we can talk about, yes, the ease in finding joy, because it's so easy to be preoccupied very fast by negative things that are all around us. But that is a lost opportunity to also see the joy and the abundance and the beautiful evolutions that humanity has made in so many centuries and really believing that collectively we can create a better future for all. And I think the beauty is this too, is because of technology, we can get out farther, but there's that blessing and curse to things because the human side of connection to me is like the most important gift. And that can happen wherever we are. And we can connect across continents and keep in touch with people across continents and uh, really participate in a way that can be a learning experience for all. So bravo. I am so glad that you're doing that. And just count me in on however I may be a helpful participant in your research. So Lynn, any final thoughts on living a more joyful life? Ah, you know, I have to tell you, Andrea, I have initial three L's as my initials. And it was very funny many years back when my godson was young, because he loved like to laugh and say, okay, here we go. We had this. And I'd say, yes, that's live, laugh and love. So my three L's takes on a different meaning. Yes, it could be Lynn Louise Lambrecht, but it can also be live, laugh and love. Because I I think that brings joy to every day. Let's leave. Let's laugh. And make sure to love. It's so simple, right? (laughs) We just need to put into practice and be reminded of those three words every single day. Yeah. Yeah. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Lynn. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. It was great to see you. Likewise.